Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this very special event with Sir Richard Lees. Sir Richard is a familiar face to Pro Manchester and a friend, and we are often blessed with, with his company. Um, and this time is no exception, but this year, actually, I'm really excited to announce that this is, this is one of two events that we have got planned up, planned for, for Pro Manchester. And coming in July, Sir Richard is going to be hosting our very first physical lunch. So we're really looking forward to that, all being well with, with timelines and, and hitting those all important dates. But hopefully in July, Sir Richard will be joining us in the flesh to, uh, to, to do another announcement and another delivery um, for us. That would be great. So um, this year has undoubtedly been really, really tough for all of, all of us. But I think in Manchester, we are luckier than most because we have a really, really strong, experienced leadership team with Sir Richard at the forefront and helping to guide us through what has been, you know, undoubtedly a really, really tough year. And I think this is what Sir Richard is going to be talking about today, perhaps a little reflectively looking back on the past year, but also looking at what we've got to look forward to in the future and how, as a region, we can build back better. Just a little housekeeping, can I ask you all to keep your microphones and cameras off? We will be asking you to input some questions. You can do that by either raising your hand or by putting your questions in the chat. We do want to make it as interactive as possible, but to, just to avoid any sound pollution, can we please make sure that your, your mics are off for the duration of the speeches? Now, without further ado, if I could please hand over to Sir Richard. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Simon. Thanks for the invitation. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward even more to being able to see people in, in real life. It's, uh, uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm one of those people who came to the conclusion very early on that working from home is not the future. Uh, hated it and I'm delighted that uh, most of the week I'm uh, back in the office, although not many other people uh, are as yet. I hope that's going to change soon. Uh, Sam was talking about the year we've just uh, been through, and uh, I think it's important when we think about the future not to underestimate, first of all, the impact of the year we've just been through, and uh, also to acknowledge that it's not quite over uh, yet. Uh, it is uh, the most traumatic year we've had as a nation that the world's had, uh, since the Second World War, and that means for the vast majority of us, it's the most traumatic year uh, that we've ever experienced in our lives. For uh, our colleagues working at the uh, front line, both in the health and care uh, part of society, uh, it, it was very similar conditions to what they might have uh, uh, experienced in field hospitals, in, in battlefield situations, and all those issues around post-traumatic stress uh, that go with that. And that's not just reflected in uh, health and care professionals either. And uh, Greater Manchester have been, Health and Care Partnership have been doing regular surveys to really understand what's happening with our population. There have been quite large scale surveys and uh, in every one over a number of months, the number of people reporting issues around uh, uh, mental health and well-being has gone up. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, recovery. Uh, before we move on to the uh, Q&A part of this session, but a little bit about recovery is going to be personal recovery as well as uh, economic reco recovery. Where we are now, and uh, I, I think does give us some grounds for uh, optimism, and um, vaccination programme has, has certainly had uh, an impact. It's continuing to have an impact and probably one of my big messages that I deliver at least once, once a week is that uh, uh, for everybody, when you get the chance to have your first vaccination, get it as quickly as possible, then make sure you, you get your second as, as well, because it really is making a difference. And if we've been talking back in uh, February, we would have been talking about a hospital system uh, that was on the verge of uh, uh, falling down and the pressure on it was uh, that great. It is still under great pressure, but that pressure is less now from uh, COVID than from certainly uh, a significant increase of people attending A&E and the pressure on the acute sector to play catch up. The backlog of uh, cases that has built up over uh, the, the 12 months of COVID is enormous. Uh, not so much in the diagnostics, which is uh, 
been able to continue certainly in the second lockdown uh, relatively normally uh, but in those people that require surgical operations because we weren't able to keep a lot of those going because the anaesthetists that were required for the operations were also required in the COVID wards uh, as well. I think you're going to see probably regular stories about waiting lists uh, in a whole range of areas. Uh, there's not a lot we can do about those waiting lists other than everything we can to do the catch up. And I just want to sure everybody, I talk regularly to colleagues in the hospital sector and they are doing everything they possibly can to do catch up and already in a number of areas that they are operating at above 100% of what will be seen as being, uh, being normal. Uh, clearly there is a roadmap to uh, unlocking uh, we've got uh, the next stage of that roadmap coming up uh, to the middle of next month, in the middle of May. At the moment, I think we are on track to be able to hit the measures set that should allow us to move to that uh, next stage. Uh, in terms of prevalence in Greater Manchester, I think uh, as of today, all 10 districts were uh, in the amber category, so below 50 cases uh, per 100,000 people. But more importantly, for over 60s, uh, every district was in the green uh, category. And the over 60s is really important because I can, I can use the we on this. Uh, we are the people that if we contract uh, COVID are most likely to be hospitalised, most likely to get seriously ill and end up in ICU um, and are most likely to die. So the fact that we've got very low cases amongst the over 60s is, is very good news uh, in, indeed. Um, in terms of positivity rates, um, they are generally uh, going going down and say so we don't have the same pressure on our hospitals that we had uh, a few months ago. There are still risks and uh, we need to be acutely aware of, of those risks that there are still probably a uh, sufficient number of cases for new variants to develop. There is risk from new imported va uh, variants as well. So really, really important that uh, we continue to play safe as we go through the unlocking process. Uh, now, I've talked probably about the clinical side of health recovery. I've also talked a little bit about the uh, medical side, uh, the mental health side of, uh, of recovery. I think, again, something we need to be aware of is that those mental health issues, uh, first of all, can be potentially long lasting. Uh, there's certainly also issues around long COVID as well. And in Greater Manchester, we have a strategy for dealing with uh, with long long COVID. Uh, but it's also for uh, some of those mental health problems, they will not necessarily emerge until some time after trauma has passed. And we need to be sensitive to that going forward as well. The uh, last stage of... Uh, uh, that we've just been through of unlocking was the, the move towards outdoor hospitality and the reopening of uh, non-essential retail. I think the, the general view after two and a half weeks in Manchester is that it has gone really, really uh, well. And the premises that have opened, and it's only about a third of uh, hospitality premises, and clearly many of them don't have uh, the uh, outdoor space in order to be able to reopen but all those that, that have reopened have been incredibly busy uh, for those people that thought that uh, uh, 12 months of lockdown had uh, turned us all into takeaway food addicts and we won't want to go out any anymore uh, they've been proved completely uh, wrong lots of places are booked up for weeks uh, ahead including for when they hopefully reopen uh, in, indoors and from a compliance point of view, uh, uh, Greater Manchester Police and the Council Licensing and Environmental Health Officers have had to tackle a relatively small number uh, of issues. So all of that has gone really, really well. Um, we are slowly beginning to see uh, office workers uh, coming back. I was talking to a business yesterday uh, where they were certainly already exceeding over 50% of their employees uh, coming back and talking to a business where uh, they'd underestimated 
the enthusiasm of their staff coming back and having to take more uh, more space. And so we are beginning to see that slow return to uh, normal. And at the moment, the number of vacancies being advertised in uh, in Manchester is greater than it was in 2019. So it's fairly clear that some sectors of our economy have uh, not only survived through uh, COVID, that uh, they're on a position to come out strong and to, to start to thrive and uh, hopefully get Manchester back onto the trajectory it was in the in the pre-COVID uh, pre days. Clearly, we're not leaving all of that to uh, chance. And you can see that in the return of hospitality, uh, Council and Greater Manchester Police working together uh, have, I think, uh, done really, really well in providing the space for businesses to uh, re reopen and to reopen with the success I've described uh, uh, previously. We're also working with uh, public transport operators to see how, how we can uh, maximize capacity there, knowing that uh, at the moment that public transport is already reaching peak capacity with two meter social distancing, we have to find new ways of being able to uh, utilize transport to get people into work without having to resort to the uh, resort to the private car. We also clearly have uh, very clear economic strategies. Uh, Greater Manchester one and sitting within that City of Manchester's uh, uh, strategy, uh, which are both people orientated, they're about skills, about skill development, about supporting uh, our young people into e further education and training and hence into uh, work and our older people. Uh, uh, the, the two categories of people who are have suffered most from furlough and the interruptions of the economy are young people and, and older people. So we are doing everything we can to support them back into work. And we also have strategies to ensure that uh, business can continue uh, to grow. The uh, big one for Greater Manchester is uh, the uh, innovation uh, program, Inno In Innovation Manchester program, and that's reflected in innovations being a priority for the city. Alongside that, a priority of improving our public uh, realm, particularly in the in the city centre. Of, uh, of coupling economic recovery with our plans for a, a greener city and particularly a, a zero carbon city by developing a major retrofit policy and also a scheme that puts all of those together in the plans to uh, refurbish the better part of North Manchester General Hospital, uh, rebuild the rest, build a new psychiatric hospital, but also build community and training facilities and work facilities uh, alongside uh, that along with housing that's appropriate to a health and care setting uh, as, as well. So uh, we, a number of schemes or others besides that, I'm not going to go through them all, but things that will really uh, be able to make sure that we can uh, relaunch our economy and take full advantage of all the schemes that we believe government will be putting forward later in uh, the year to provide that sort of f fiscal stimulus that I think will be needed, not just post-COVID, but post-Brexit uh, as, as well. Um, everybody I talk to uh, around com uh, the commercial side of the city uh, sounds incredibly positive about it. There is a lot of confidence out there. Uh, there is a lot of building taking place, and I'm afraid you might get a lot of bangs on this call from me because I'm right next down the door to uh, one of our biggest building sites, which is the uh, the old uh, the old town hall refurbishment taking place uh, next door. But there's a lot of other stuff ha happening as well. So I think there are a few e e uh, easy. Uh, things we need to do, and it is maintaining hygiene standards. It's being very, very careful that we don't become uh, uh, spreaders. It's about uh, supporting regular testing. It's about making sure people vac uh, get vaccinated. And, and if we do that, we ought to be able to see uh, a return to normality sooner rather than uh, sooner rather than later. In terms of that return to normality, and um, we've considered that to be a three to five year job. Uh, to be able to get back to where we were. Obviously, if we can do it faster, uh, all, all, all the better. But in these early days of coming out of lockdown, all the signs so far are uh, really, really positive. Perhaps the last thing I'll say before moving to the uh, Q&A, 
all of this, as always, in a Manchester way, depends on us all working together. It depends on partnership, depends on the public and private sector uh, pulling together. We've got a pretty good track record on that. Uh, I'm sure we will do that again. And that will give me even more confidence that we are going to have uh, a very bright future as a city and we will return very rapidly to our growth trajectory. Uh, and I think Anthony's now joined us. I know he's having problems earlier. So Anthony, I'll hand over to you and we'll move into the uh, Q&A. Uh, th uh, thank you, Sir Richard. Uh, yes, I've got the very interesting uh, dynamic here that I'm looking at you on my laptop and listening to you on my phone and now also listening to myself. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and get through this uh, as it is, but uh, you know, technical hitches is what you expect on these things. Um, uh, firstly, I'd just like to thank you for sparing the time to come and uh, talk to members of Pro Manchester. I know you've, you know, you're a, a, a supporter of us in the past and uh, it's, you know, it's really great that uh, we get to hear from you uh, both in terms of um, what your uh, views are around the pandemic. Um, but I think what I'd like to touch on today is um, your future plans for Manchester and in particular how businesses, Manchester businesses can help both in the recovery and also not just the recovery from pandemic, but also in some of your broader ambitions around uh, inequalities, um, climate change, all of the all of the other challenges that we were facing even before COVID uh, COVID came about. So, I think just to uh, just to start off, clearly Pro Manchester has a, a broad range of businesses, uh, both in terms of size and sector, from global businesses to small businesses like ourselves. Um, how would you, one of the things we're facing at the moment is how we come back into the city as a, as a workforce. And you hear some conflicting stories around expectations and responsibilities. Um, how would you like to see, or how do you think businesses should be approaching this in terms of when they're thinking around um, bringing employees back into the, back into the office? Okay, so a uh, good question. I, I'm, I'm going to uh, take advantage now of speaking again, though, uh, uh, Anthony, I see Deirdre has put a, a question about the, the strategy for long COVID. I'll just answer that one. You ought to be able to find it on the Greater Manchester Health and Care Partnership website. If you can't find it there, send me an email and I'll send it along to you. So, but it should be on the, uh, the website there. Uh, I think first, I, I sort of touched on uh, transport issues whilst we, we are maintaining uh, social, uh, social distancing. Uh, I think the first thing to say is that uh, what we don't want is uh, everybody turning up for work at nine o'clock uh, in the morning and everybody going home at five o'clock in, in the afternoon. So one of the things we would ask businesses to do is to try and phase uh, start and finish times to uh, really to spread that load over the transport uh, uh, network. I think clearly most businesses will be adopting uh, flexible working as uh, uh, any anyway. And flexible working, as we know, isn't the same as working working from home. But it is about different paths of work that take the pressure off. Uh, I think the second thing I would say is that uh, I think. Uh, Businesses, but particularly professional businesses, uh, have to be uh, acutely aware of uh, uh, that how healthy their working environment uh, uh, is. So I think the days of trying to cram as many people into uh, as um, desks as possible uh, are, are gone, really. It is about having a, a probably slightly more space in the office, a, a more a healthier working in, environment, although there is lots of evidence that businesses that were doing that pre-COVID were also getting better productivity out of it as well. So uh, this is, uh, th there may be a, a, a cost, but the gains are quite often bigger than the uh, uh, than the uh, cost and indeed the retention of staff is a lot better if you have a healthy working environment uh, as well. That's coupled with what we're talking about as a, a council about improving public realm within the city centre. Again, it's about having that healthier uh, environment for people to uh, as come, come through as they're going to and, uh, to and from. 
uh, work. So I think it is thinking about uh, uh, flexibility. It is thinking about spreading the journey time. It is about what the environment is like when people get to work. But it's also uh, some of the things I've said about uh, long COVID, what I've said about health health and uh, well-being. Uh, I think good employees are going to have to be very sensitive to uh, needs of uh, uh, their employees in that respect. Um, and, and that's difficult for small employees, but it's tr trying to work out where are the networks where you can, uh, where, where are the organizations where you can get that support if it's, uh, if it's necessary. Yeah, because because Manchester has an ecosystem <clears throat> which really uh, has uh, a, a focus on large, large, certainly professional services businesses who may have, you know, a few thousand people in their offices that support a lot of the small, um, you know, I'll use coffee shops because that's always the example to, to, to give just through footfall and traveling through around there. If those big businesses make a decision to, you know, really change, um, how they how they're going to house their employees then that could have a knock-on effect with the, the the smaller businesses that those employees support uh, i think that's right and there are i think a lot of big businesses jumped uh very early and yeah. are probably going to have to jump back um and they have to jump back for a, a number of reasons uh, but the biggest one is that they will all become less first of all they will become less attractive to work for and secondly they are likely to become less creative and less productive because uh, actually i think we know that uh, innovation creativity uh, comes out of interaction it doesn't come out of uh, sitting in front of a, a computer screen most uh, m m most of the time uh, and I guess for uh, the smaller businesses, if the big businesses uh, do that, it's really good for them because they'll be able to grow as on the uh, on, on on the back of it. So I think there are going to be uh, some real challenges uh, uh, around uh, that. I have talked to people uh, from you know, major uh, corporates, even who even back in the autumn uh, were were talking about. Uh, uh, actually productivity going down lack of identity with the company going uh, going down uh, the fact that there was that lack of interaction uh, was becoming a real problem and if you look at in, uh, going, looking forward at recruitment the people who most want to be back in the office tend to be tend to be younger people your ability to recruit the, uh, anybody's ability to recruit will uh, uh, stimulate uh, but I think there's a question from Sam about reimagining the concept, the idea of uh, of work, which are, uh, work will be different, but I think it's different by probably accelerating trends that already existed rather than uh, new 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 trends. And it's said sort of what I talked about really the office of the future. Uh, I, I think smart employees were already beginning to do uh, that. I think that process will uh, uh, accelerate. So will uh, new ways, new new ways of working. And um, there are things that come out of I, I think uh, uh, what we've been doing digitally over the last twelve months that will become uh, built in parts parts of uh, everyday business as well. I think that's undoubtedly uh, undoubtedly the case. But uh, work, I think my, my view, work will be different. But people, by and large, will still come to work and perhaps one thing I'll, last thing i'll add to that in a a city where we still have major challenges around equality and covid19 really showed the issues around equality uh, everybody working from home is most definitely discriminatory uh, and that's something that uh, actually will not help us meet our objectives of having a fair and more equal manchester mm. yeah i think that's a really good point certainly around the fact that um, that inequality that existed has really been compounded in certainly in some areas, and and there, were, you know, there were a lot of um, in the northwest, some local regions that still appear in some of the wrong lists. Uh, and I know there's been lots of work going on and plans to to address that. Do you think COVID and the and the and the sort of resources and, and money that's going to be required to recover? is going to impact on some of your ambitions in terms of how you're going to address those those problems? Uh, you use the term impact, and uh, uh, I think the answer to the question impact is yes. 
uh, what we have to do, and uh, it's something I think we've done successfully uh, in in the past, is to make sure that impact is a positive impact, not a negative uh, in, impact. And uh, as always, uh, that we see out of catastrophe, catastrophe opportunity. Um, part of our recovery plan uh, is about how we seize the opportunities that rebuilding uh, uh, brings. Um, I think a couple, there, there is, again, there's a question in the chat comparing current situation with uh, 1996, and which, which is more difficult, the rebuilding we're doing now uh, or the rebuilding we did then. Uh, first of all, say the rebuilding we're doing now is going to be more difficult, mm -hmm. um, but also has more opportunity uh, within it. And I say this because in 1996, uh, yeah, there are over 200 people uh, injured, many of them seriously injured, uh, a lot of people still traumatised by events 25, uh, 25 years ago, but the rebuilding process was largely a physical rebuilding uh, process. Uh, I think a big chunk of what we're going to be doing over the next three to five years is going to be rebuilding people as well as, uh, and, and that is always a more challenging task, but it also does give us that opportunity to have uh, uh, actually uh, uh, that greener economy to have that fairer uh, economy to give our younger people different uh, opportunities so uh, yeah impact definitely uh, we have to make sure it is that positive impact yeah well, no absolutely uh, and, and all of this thing obviously is going to cost money and at the moment it appears when whenever you listen to Sunak uh, that there, there's just a never-ending supply of of cash around that's being allocated to different initiatives do you see that uh, manchester's or any material changes to Man manchester's budgeting or allocation of capital coming out from uh, any of uh, any of this and what's coming out of central government well i think one of the impacts for us as the council is uh, in the uh... The budget started at the beginning of April this year. We're, we're making £40 million worth of cuts, and that's on top of over £300 million over the last uh, 10 years. So uh, our capacity to lead the recovery has, is certainly diminished as a, uh, as a result of that. And there's the challenges for, for us as a council. We have a, uh, a number of work streams on the head, heading of future council on the basis we cannot continue to operate on the way uh, that we have been doing over the, the, the last few years. So uh, the money that's come in from government at the moment has come in really, I wouldn't say dribs and drabs, but you get, uh, uh, it, it comes in kind of two month intervals. Uh, that is not a basis for which you plan uh, plan for the future. And what I would hope to see out of the spending review that's going to take place uh, this, this year is uh, that, first of all, that uh, public sector funding, but local government funding in particular, is put on a, a stable long-term footing so that we can plan and, and support properly over the, the coming period, uh, period of time, uh, but also that fiscal stimulus measures move to uh, a rather more strategic basis than they have been so far. So, for example, the levelling up fund uh, has, it, it's, A, it's not a levelling up fund because it's everywhere in the country is theoretically eligible uh, for it. And it's not, it's not underpinned by a strategic uh, approach to how we regr regrow the economy. So uh, I'm hoping that later, that later in the year we will see from government both a longer term approach and a more strategic approach because that because i think that sort of uh, you know the funding available is quite important particularly to smaller businesses in the area for whom making the necessary changes to be compliant with coming back or making necessary changes because their type of you know how they conducted business 14 months ago is going to be very different going forward what support is there likely well, available now or likely to be available in the in the future for those businesses to well, yeah to, to make it, the changes uh, in the current year there are some grants that come from uh, through the council but from government money like restart uh, grants that are aimed at starting businesses uh, getting businesses that's what it says on the tin really uh, restarted and uh, up, up and running uh, and I think there is some differentiation within that so when we talk about get the economy 
uh, going again. And, uh, clearly, you're obviously concerned about uh, uh, professional businesses within the city. There are some parts of the economy, professional businesses probably, uh, digital businesses which actually have been growing. There's a whole range of sectors where uh, getting, getting back up and running will not really be a problem, uh, a problem at all. Um, I think uh, retail faces some challenges. Retail has to change, I think, fairly fundamentally. Uh, and it, 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 you know, we've seen the change. We've seen an acceleration in the growth of uh, online shopping. Uh, again, there are opportunities in, in, in that, which is a move away from uh, national multiple pools to uh, perhaps a, a more diverse, independent uh, uh, retail retail sector. And that requires not just the retail sector to change, but also landlords to change as, as well. They're going to have to change their, their, their practices. Possibly the, uh, the sector that uh, I think will probably come back really, really strongly, but uh, will be very late is that around uh, tourism, culture, hospitality. Uh, well, we see hospitality coming back uh, uh, now because culture, in particular, if you can't have a live audience for a lot of it, you haven't got a you haven't got a, 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 an activity, and so uh, we have to make sure that we've got the right differentiation of support of not treating every business and every sector uh, sector the same. The moment culture has been relatively well supported by them uh, through uh, government grants. We have to make sure that, that those taps aren't turned off too soon before they have the opportunity to get fully up and running again. But we do have to look at it on a sectoral basis because not every business is, uh, well, as you know, not every, even within professional services, not every business is the same. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very hard to generalise, isn't it? you know different sectors have been impacted in, in in different ways and i think you touched upon earlier uh, about the property sector and the and and the development that you know that we see around us uh, in city center and has been astonishing over the last 10 years do you see that continuing uh I, 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 th I, th I think I do, actually. Uh, we've not talked about the residential sector at all, but uh, uh, lettings, uh, once people are able to start viewing properties again, lettings and in, indeed uh, uh, the housing is, uh, has, it's still continuing to, uh, to boom. There is still an enormous desire for uh, a particular sort of urban, urban lifestyle. And it is that, it is the quality of life issues that fuel the economy that we've, we, we've been building. Uh, the demand is still there uh, uh, for, for that. And uh, going back to what we were discussing re really uh, early on in this discussion about some of those major international corporates, uh, effectively they will need to be where those skilled uh, people want, uh, want, want to be. Um, for a lot of them, yeah, some people are very happy uh, working from the middle of nowhere. Most people aren't. They they want to meet. They want to engage with other people. Yeah. Oh, I remember listening to you speak, I think, in 2019. I can't remember what the event was, but it certainly involved some of some representatives from the university. And you spoke uh, very passionately about the importance of Manchester becoming a, a global city um in order for it to remain competitive and for its businesses to be competitive um clearly the universities have you know had a you know had a bit of a torrid time of it over the last uh 12 months do you think as a result of covid that actually uh, the, the the role of a global city you know insofar as there is one uh remains that important and certainly is imp that important for manchester uh, well, I, I think so. Actually, if, if you talk about universities, uh, just take the University of Manchester and their halls of residence. Uh, for the last four or five months, when all of those students are supposed to be at home, uh, occupation levels have been around 85%. Uh, so uh, this is an example, really. 85% um, uh, of students uh, made a choice, stay at home with parents or come back to Manchester. <laughs> uh, not a hard choice, really. They came back to, uh, uh, even though they weren't supposed to, that's, that, that's what they did. And uh, that, kind of, I think, sort of demonstrates the, uh, the point, really. But uh, I think that the, the, the sort of concentration of research you will get in a, 
uh, a city like Manchester is is really really important, but also in some of those growth areas and growth areas going forward, it is cities that give you the benefit of agglomeration, and uh, th that agglomeration effect will continue to make uh, cities really really uh, key to economic growth going forward. Okay, uh, I'm just I'm conscious of time, but I really, I want to move on to climate change because I know that's an area where. Your, let, uh, Angela, let me just take this uh, one from Dan in the chat, which if, if I'll take about. Uh, will the council be doing the same about staggering employee work patterns? Uh, uh, that's certainly our, our intention. Uh, I also talked about the uh, long term, some of the long term benefits of uh, rapid digitalization is that for some time now, uh, we've been increasing the number of people who will access council services on a self-serve basis and do it digitally. Uh, expect that to uh, in increase, which uh, of course gives 24-7 uh, access to uh, being able to uh, request a service. And face-to-face uh, -face service is not, it will be by appointment rather than, uh, again, moving away from, uh, from dropping. But we we'll certainly will be... Uh, staggering our own employee uh, work patterns as we start to return to normal. Go on, climate change. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, no, because I, I, I know you're, um, you know, you, you, you champion sustainability and you've got some, you know, big plans for Manchester in terms of sustainability. Um, I'm just thinking with two questions, really. One, um, just looking at the point you made around budgets and, and budget cuts, whether or not um, looking forward, the, the, the sort of aims for sustainability were, were achievable. And, and secondly, the government's announcement that they were gonna bring forward carbon emission cuts 15 years to 2035, I think, whether or not you thought that was actually uh, just political rhetoric or it was something that was you know what, what was achievable as a nation and also as, for Manchester? Uh, well our, our target uh, for the last two years now has been 2038 to become zero uh, carbon. Uh, meeting that target was always going to be dependent on uh, government uh, accelerating its program and particularly to decarbonize the electricity uh, supply. So uh, I think that is uh, 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 doable and if government's going to do that we'll probably be able to bring our target for bef to before 2035 as a consequence of uh, of, uh, of that there are also actually things like just being able to say right from a certain date we will have no uh, diesel or petrol engine uh, cars starts to that re regulatory change starts to transform industry very very uh, very very rapidly because the, the changes start uh, start now so I think it is challenging there is no doubt about that but I think it is also uh, uh, also doable so but the, the I think the biggest single factor in the, in all of this is decarbonizing of our uh, electricity supply turning the gas off uh, decarbonizing our electricity supply although actually the potential at least in some areas to replace gas with hydrogen is probably worth exploring but it's going to require quite a significant investment and effort into infrastructure and it's it's how you know how you know one how is that going to get paid for and secondly businesses i guess are going to play a pretty important role certainly city center businesses in terms of achieving that it, it, you know is, is there any plans in terms of supporting and helping businesses um you know contribute towards the uh, the, the effort well I, I think the thing to say about this it, this at the moment about uh, in terms of the, our zero carbon agenda about 20 percent of manchester and this includes businesses is engaged uh, in in that and is engaged with the climate change partnership so i think the fir first step is um, is for businesses and it's open to all businesses to get engaged with the climate change partnership and become uh, part of the uh, uh, collectively part of the solution um so uh, and that that's going to be a key step to uh, getting there in terms of affordability 
Uh, I, I think I was reading something last week, so 20 years ago, uh, the price of a kilowatt of uh, solar power was about uh, 75 quid. Now it's 15p. Uh, that actually, as, as we move to uh, decarbonize uh, sources, most of them are becoming a lot more ch cheaper, more affordable, and are very rapidly becoming cheaper than the, the uh, uh, carbonized energy so actually as we move there it, it becomes viable i think there is support and there's support through the growth company to businesses to do the uh, the the business planning around uh, how effectively they can be more efficient and effective by moving in a more sustainable uh, way so there is support provided from uh, from that point of view should government be investing more to support businesses in that direction yes and um, but that, if if they're serious about that strategy that's got to follow that support's got to be there uh, clearly in terms of uh, uh, the buildings you occupy uh, that we will we're requiring uh, a new build to be zero carbon by 2028 so we're accelerating the move to uh, uh, zero carbon buildings retrofit is slightly uh, more more complex with the business cases have to be made by retrofit but going back to something we discussed earlier i, I think there is now fairly uh, sound evidence that uh, uh, from an energy point of view people working from home with their gas central heating on is actually consuming and emitting far more uh, carbon than people coming into the office so actually having that good working environment in the office alone and getting people back in will help uh, contribute to reducing emissions so I think we're just going to go to. I would say, questions. actually, Anthony, if like me, they also come by bike or walk, that will leave. That will help even more. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the cycling thing is quite a quite a good uh, example of areas where perhaps you know some of the planning um, can be extended to you know out you know and more encouraging to make it to make it safer and and people feel. You know, a bit more comfortable in, yeah, using, that, in this. That, that's absolutely right. But I have to say, on the, on the stats, uh, the, the, the days it rains, uh, mm. the, the uh, number of commuter cyclists halves. So uh, we probably have to put a roof over the city as well to uh, get everybody <laughs> to do active yeah, travel well, all the time. I'm definitely a fair weather cyclist, so I fall into that. I fall into that category. So just before, I, I suppose, just before I go on to the um, questions, uh, we've got uh, elections coming up. Um, are you looking forward to continuing to work with Andy Burnham? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I'm, I, I've been. Uh... As well as being leader of the city council, I've been uh, uh, deputy mayor for the uh, for the four years. At the beginning of uh, uh, last year, last uh, March, uh, I, I moved from the business portfolio for Greater Manchester to the uh, to the health portfolio, uh, with absolutely wonderful uh, uh, wonderful timing. But I did that for a reason. There is, uh, I think, there are uh, real challenges uh, in health and care. We're on a devolution journey that we now need to take to the next stage. Uh, so looking and planning for the five years ahead, but the next stage where the health inequalities, which I said COVID-19 has really laid bare, uh, become to the top of the agenda and population health comes to the top of the agenda as well. Clearly we want a health system that when people are sick is clinically excellent, but far too many people get sick who don't need to get sick. And that is the bigger task. And actually over 80% of what you need to do to uh, tackle that end uh, of, the, of the problem has got nothing to do with the health and care system. It is about exercise, it is about diet, it is about decent homes, it is about employment and a decent, decent wage. And it, it is all those uh, uh, determinants of uh, poor or good health that we need to be tackling. And I think there's a real opportunity uh, there. And uh, that's kind of being able to put the system in place that allows us to do that more effectively is the challenge I took on. And I think, again, uh, because of uh, things we've learned through COVID, I think we're probably in a better position to start tackling those challenges now than we were 18 months ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly some, there's some complex, complex issues that have been around and, you know, not been made any easier over the last, over the last 12 months. Uh, just looking at questions, and I think you've managed to pick those up as they've, they've gone through. So um, 
I suppose I've got one question, and, and I hope you don't mind me asking it. But um, the last, obviously, the last fourteen months have been, you know, uh, almost you know, uh, unprecedented in incredible challenges for for everyone, and certainly the council. Um, are there any things that, with the benefit of hindsight, are there any things that you would have done differently? Uh, I think there are things that. Uh, government should have done uh, differently. And there, there are aspects of managing COVID that should have been localised and they still apply this um, f uh, far more quickly. Uh, uh, test track trace contain um, should have been localised, uh, fully localised a long, a long time ago. Uh, lots and lots of evidence that uh, not just in Manchester, but when we do it, compared to when the national body does it, uh, we are far more efficient and effective in 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 in, in doing it. Uh, supply of uh, PPE was uh, uh, pretty disastrous. We are still supplying PPE because the, uh, the national systems don't uh, still don't follow, fully operate. Uh, the national command and control model uh, has been shown to uh, be. be well, pretty fundamentally flawed, and um, we can look at the vaccination. And uh, there's no doubt that uh, vaccination has been a great success, largely because government had the foresight to order lots and lots of uh, a vaccine. The delivery of the program has been rather less efficient than you might uh, uh, might imagine from the uh, uh, from the outside, as all those people who've got uh, two different invitations to go to different places to have the the vaccine have, uh, have, have found out all of that was resolvable predictable and resolve, uh, re resolvable, but again, needed that local element of management in order to uh, to el eliminate those, those, those problems. So uh, I think anybody doing uh, a serious analysis would say, yes, uh, there are elements of this programme that were absolutely had to be national, but the, the balance between national and local was has been largely wrong consistently all, all the way through. And even with something like a pandemic where um, clearly nearly none of us knew what we were dealing with at the beginning. And you know, fair, uh, I have to say, I'll let government off that. They, I, I had no more idea than they had that, but, but what we were uh, go, going into. And there, there had to be that learning on the, uh, on, on the hoof, but I think we could have been better at the learning as well as we went through that, uh, uh, went through that process. And government should have been more strategic. Uh, even 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 early on, that there should have been long term planning within there that just wasn't uh, uh, wasn't there. Uh, so, uh, are there are there things we could have done better as a, 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 a council? There undoubtedly would be. I, 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 top of, I mean, we, we clearly will do those post mortems to find out. But actually, a lot of what we and other councils were doing uh, was basically uh, filling the holes left in the uh, that absence of uh, joined up strategy at a national level. That we were joining the dots at a local local level, and that's not the optimum way of doing it. So, if you're not doing it in the optimum way, you're going to get things wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Right, we've got a question from Andrew Huff. Uh, Sir Richard, great to hear your support for cycling, as always. In terms of public transport, do you have any thoughts on how to better provide ticketing options that support flexible working and help with capacity issues? I know there is the Clipper ticket on Metrolink. Well, the other thing we have on uh, Metrolink is uh, capped day, uh, daily fares and uh, uh, you can use the entire network without having to get a different ticket. You, uh, you also have... Uh, the opportunity of buying a ticket or being able to uh, use smart card uh, on, on there. So it has uh, all the advantages you will have of a smart smart system. And uh, at the end of March, uh, a recommendation of the combined authority, the mayor made the decision to uh, that we'll move to a franchise system for buses that's subject to a, a judicial review. Um, uh, probably, uh, in, I think it's being heard in May, probably shouldn't say too much about it. Pro there are probably members of Pro Manchester who will be making an income on both sides of, uh, of that going, going forward. So, uh, But clearly we hope that we'll be able to move to that franchise system. That franchise system will allow us to do uh, what we've done with Metrolink 
uh, on the entirety of the bus network over a five-year period of time, but also joining it up with the Metrolink network as, as well, so it can operate as one system. And we are hoping and indeed have been lobbying government that out of the rail review that we can also start to apply that across commuter rail services as, as well so that we can have uh, for commuter travel across Greater Manchester and uh, just outside Greater Manchester as well, that we really can have a wholly joined up uh, London style system across the whole piece. That's great. Um, so I think as you know, there's no more questions there. Um, so it's always great to hear from you, uh, Sir Richard, and it's interesting to see your thoughts on where we've got to and certainly on the future um, for businesses looking to understand, uh, you know, how they come out of this recovery. Um, you know, it's really important. There's a, there's a lot more questions than there are answers at the moment. And I think as you pointed out whilst the health side of this pandemic seems to have some light at the end of the tunnel the economic and financial side you know I think still got some got some um, distance to run on that so once again thank you very much for your time can, today it was a pleasure can I thank you as well because actually the, I, I saw in the chat that Sam had put in that you are engaged with the uh, climate change agency as an or, or, organization which is great so uh, thank you for, uh, thank you for that it is really important that we have business engagement and we have business uh, partnership we've got really active business sounding board at the moment that have been supporting uh, a lot with the recovery groups like united city that have been again actively promoting getting people back back, back to work uh it's quite quite clear is we can't do it without you so uh, keep it up and thanks very much oh in a minute we've got a last minute one come in here from claire marie just as you thought you were escaping uh what is being what is being done to ensure there will be improved equality for women and girls across Greater Manchester as part of the recovery? <laughs> uh, wow. Um, it, all, 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 all in, all in four, uh, four minutes. I, I, I think, first of all, that um, uh, in all issues to do with equality, that we need to look at those issues that go across a whole sector and those that where we need to segment. So uh, I think one of the, the big issues that we are taking on at the moment around women and girls is uh, safety. Uh, and particularly uh, safety from violence and the fear of uh, uh, violence, because uh, if, if women are uh, frightened to go to certain places at certain, certain times, then they cannot uh, participate fully in, in the way. So uh, that's a, a, a number one. We're clearly looking at uh, uh, education and training for the, applies uh, not just to girls but to uh, uh, to women uh, we are looking at uh, uh, certainly apprenticeships and other routes into what would have been seen once upon a time as uh, non-traditional industries uh, uh, and if I go next door to the town hall now is if I'd gone to that, a site like that 10 years ago, there probably would be no women on it. There are now quite a lot of women uh, on, on there and uh, working a whole range of capacities. So we are beginning to open up those, uh, uh, th those, those sectors. Um, clearly business has a big part to, uh, to doing that as well. So uh, uh, making sure that there aren't glass ceilings, uh, well, there are glass ceilings, so it is helping smash those glass uh, ceilings. We, we, we know that. So I think there is a, a, a route there. I don't think the thought is, it is to make sure that uh, women and girls have, have a voice. I can say for I just uh, because we're coming up to our AGM of the City Council's Labour Group, um, that uh, again, that if you look at pictures of the council, uh, from a hundred years ago, I think you might have seen three or four women. Uh, my Labour group now has 47 women and 45 men. So we have a majority of women uh, on the uh, on, on the council. It is the next stage is to make sure, that, of course, that those uh, uh, women are uh, at least equally represented in se senior roles within the, uh, the council. Uh, we've done it uh, actually uh, if, if you look at the senior leadership team, the executive senior leadership for, uh, uh, for the council, it is almost entirely women uh, uh, now, which uh, so we, we're making progress uh, 
in, in, in there, but it needs to be reflected in the politics, in the decision making as, as well. Uh, part of the route to equality is there has to be, once women are equal, at least in making decisions, then a lot of the rest of the access will follow. Oh, that's a great answer. Okay, so thank you once again. Thank you very much for your time, Sir Richard. Uh, it's you know, always welcome and, uh, and good luck with the recovery. Thank you very much. Good luck to you as well.